out side of the break, right? That's ridiculous. That shouldn't happen. Something else that uh, I know you've seen is uh, some of the people who are doing the training actually uh, taking photographs on their mobile phones of uh, some of the secure, secure areas. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we know for a fact um, terrorists take surveillance photos. Um, they, they, they did it in 9-11. They had the rehearsals. They've done it in 7-7. Uh, they had rehearsals for that. Um, people in my class that I've seen have been taking photos. Now, we're told that there's mobile phone jammers in every room, in every corridor, and that your mobile phone w won't work. You may be able to take one or two photographs, but after, you know, a week or so, your phone will, will, will die a death, apparently, right? And so, you know, I questioned again one of the trainers about this, and he said, he told me, no, 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 there's no jammers, it's a verbal deterrent, right? And so what happens is, is because it's a verbal deterrent and there's actually no jammers in any of the classrooms, um, people are taking pictures on their mobile phones. Now, a few of them have been seen. And what, all that happens is that people get tapped on the shoulder, they say, can you erase the photograph? They say yes, and they continue on with the training. Surely, those people should be taken out of the training, handed over to the police, and at least questioned and asked, why were you taking photographs of the training, of the trainers, and of the pedestrian security areas? And these are the, you know, in, in the training facility, it's an actual mock-up of what it would be like at the Olympics. So as they're taking pictures, they're filming and, 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 and photographing actually what it's going to be like, the arrangements that are actually going to be in place. This company, Creative International, is causing a terrorist breach by letting these people continue with the training, surely. Now, another thing that you've pointed out uh, is that sometimes uh, people who haven't even completed their SIA licences, and maybe you want to tell, tell us what they are, are actually being put in charge of people who are actually highly trained security officers, for example, ex-soldiers and ex-police. Yeah, that's absolutely right. The, um, the SIA licence was issued to the security industry uh, some years ago just because people, you know, the door supervisors in nightclubs and stuff were, you know, beating people up and attacking people and, and what have you, and there's all sorts of trouble. So what they decided to do, the government said, look, let's regulate the industry and we'll create the, um, uh, the SIA, which is the Security Industry Authority Licence. And so everybody who works in security has to have an SIA license, no matter who you are, whether you're from a, a security guard on a gate, a door supervisor on a nightclub, or whether you're a close protection officer working in Afghanistan for G4S, right? Everyone has to have a license. And you see them, they stand out nightclubs, they've, they've usually got the, the armband on with the blue license in the, in, in, in the pouch or around their neck in some way. So G4S have had funding from the government and from sponsors to put people through their SIA licenses because it's actually quite expensive to actually go out and get it. I think it's about 370 to 400 pounds depending on where you go. So for the person who is sort of say on the dole who hasn't worked um, you know, in a long time, long term unemployed, you know, still needs to get three or 400 pounds and go to do their SIA licenses, you know, it's not doable. So they've been given funding in order to get the long term unemployed back into work, which is a great idea. However, what they're doing is they're taking the four-day course and they're basically just rushing people through it because they've got so many thousands of people to get through these courses. They're rushing people through it. They're not completing their courses properly um, and so forth. They're not going to be trained properly in the basics of security guarding, um, you know, let alone, you know, anything else. When I did uh, the uh, SIA licence myself, I had a wonderful trainer who had worked in clubs, who was an ex-soldier, could tell you all sorts of stories and what have you, and he made sure that everybody passed the exams properly. Well, in, in G4S and their trainers, they're not doing that. Um, and so what people are doing is they get sent letters and on these letters, they've got, you're going to work in a pedestrian screening area. That's the letter I got. Someone else has got a letter saying, you're going to be a team leader. Now, a team leader is the person who's in charge of a pedestrian screening area. That is the person that, if you've got a problem, say someone walks through a metal detector and it goes off <laughs> uh, and um, you can't find the objects on the person, you put your hand up and it's team leader. That team leader is supposed to be an experienced person, someone who is calm, and professional who knows exactly what they're doing. And people who haven't even passed their SIA licenses yet are getting flagged up to be team leaders. 
Now, I had a Goethe come to me, a Goethe, right, <laughs> who says, how come I'm not a team leader? This is ridiculous. I've had ex-policemen say, well, look, you know, I've been with the, the Met Police X amount of years. I retired. I wanted to do something. I had an SIA license, so I've come to do the Olympics. And I'm not a team leader. I've got 20 years in the police. I mean, you know, this is crazy. So, again, it's, to me, my suspicious mind says something's wrong with this. And, um, you know, and uh, it's definitely not right that people are being looked over with experience against people who have not even done their SIA licenses. I don't understand that. And then it comes back down to maybe it's just a money thing. Maybe it's just cheaper just to get these people through, you know, um, as quickly as possible. They don't care who's going to be a team leader or not. You know, they get in the minimal training. Um, if anything really serious happens, I suppose the police are there. There are other people there. They can just flag it up. But still, these are people that are going to be representing um, the country, the people of this great country, so that people from all over the world. And these people are the first people you're going to meet. And, you know, with, with, again, greatest respect to everybody. They don't speak English very well. The majority of them don't, you know. Um, some don't speak English at all. We had, a, on the fourth day, we had a, a, a brief test where we had to basically talk someone through a bag search. Um, uh, and uh, uh, one person who's standing next to me couldn't speak a word of English and the trainer said, it's okay, I know what you mean. And I turned to him and said, well, <laughs> can you explain? I don't know what he means. <laughs> and I laughed. And the trainer just said, don't worry about it, mate. You know? Um, and so these people are going to be representing this great country to all these people from around the world. When you queue up with your tickets, these are the first people that you're going to meet. Basically, thugs. You know, and you know, with the greatest respect to a lot of the people there, uh, you know, a lot of them actually do want to do a good job, but are complaining constantly because they don't know what they're doing, and they know they don't know what they're doing, and they know they're going to be on show, and they know that this is going to be a big event, and they're worried that they're going to let say the side down, and everyone's talking amongst themselves, which is how I get most of my great information from. Well, I imagine that uh, hopefully, anyway, G4S will take some of what you're saying on board. Uh, do you think there's any possibility of that, or will they just be totally in denial about it? No, I, I, I shouldn't think they will at all. I mean, I really hope they do. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I mean, I'm going to be trying to get the story out before the Olympics anyway, um, uh, as best as I can, um, because I think it's really important to tighten everything up to make sure that those metal detectors are working all the time. You know, um, a friend of mine in an airport said, you know, the metal detectors ping once every 10 people, you know, and that's called a random search. That's fair enough. Why can't we just have that? They have just as many people coming through, um, you know, okay, maybe not in the peak times, but look, the metal detectors have got to work, and that's my main worry. I'm not trying to out G4S as a bad company or anything like that. I mean, they are a huge company. There's nearly a million people that work for them um, and I think that's sinister within itself actually that you know a company with nearly a million people working for them you know uh, is putting so many people into London um, at the time of the Olympics and especially as also we're being told about this uh, let me try and get my quote absolutely correct um, this defining moment in the history of London and the trainer who told me this from Contemporary International wasn't referring to the Olympics she said after the Olympics, there is going to be a defining moment in the history of London. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, we can't say, it's just that's what's going to happen. And so I'm getting worried now and thinking, well, look, there's all these foreign troops coming in. There's thousands of G4S people in the, in the country. What's going to happen? Maybe nothing. Maybe it's just a precaution. Or maybe they're just saying you're going to be employed by G4S afterwards. You know, there are lots of questions still to be asked. And I think G4S needs to actually come out and they need to tell the truth. Is it just shoddy, you know, uh, they've just, you know, bid the lowest for the contracts and they've got these contracts to fulfill and they can't fulfill them in the price that they've said, so they're cutting corners left, right and centre. If it's that, to be fair, that's okay, that can be fixed. We can deal with that. We can start doing the searches of the stadium again. We can tighten up the security, the pedestrian screening areas. Because, you know, if one person gets through into that Olympic stadium, just one, even if it's with a handgun, with one bullet in, that's going to be the Olympic message, um, you know? Uh, and to me, that's disgraceful. So, look, you know... Well, no, hang on hang on a second, though, Lee, because this defining moment you're talking about there, I mean, surely she could have been talking about something positive, you know, actually the Olympics being a positive defining moment for Britain. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely, she could have been. Um, I'm just a, I'm quite a paranoid person, and so I found it quite sinister. <laughs> well, I mean, you're not the only one. Uh, you would actually, you know, say, say you use the word paranoid flippantly there, but um, just to remind people that uh, that there's a whistleblower. Uh, working for G4S on the Olympics was sacked after speaking out uh, about uh, G4S cutting corners when vetting security staff for the Olympics. This was reported by the Daily Mail um, uh, on the 2nd of June. That's just a couple of weeks ago. Sarah Hubble was told not to return after contacting the media about her experiences working for G4S. Well, obviously, Lee, she wasn't as smart as you. She wasn't in there undercover. Uh, She said she had access to passport information, bank account details and national insurance cards but had not herself been vetted. Uh, She said staff had to process a minimum of 10 applications an hour and the documents ended piled up in corners of their office in Stockton on Tees. Uh, She claimed the system was creaking under the pressure of processing thousands of applications ahead uh, of this summer's games Uh, and uh, when when asked about it by the Daily Mail uh, G4S simply said uh, that she was lying. Yeah, yeah that sounds about right. And look, you know how many people can be lying quite honestly? You know she cared about the Olympics. We all care about the Olympics. We, what we want to see is an amazing event where this country can do itself proud, can take part in all the games, can say, hey, look, we put on an amazing event that is up there with some of the best Olympics that has ever been. That's all that we want to have happen. And companies like G4S, are, uh, you know, um, are, are doing their damnedest uh, to, to basically, you know, um, uh, make sure that that doesn't happen by not doing things properly. You know-